I appreciate the invitation to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity to share with you. I know my time is limited, so I won't say too much by way of um, preamble. I just want to... Um, I just want to say that, as, as Ian pointed out, I'm not a feast keeper. And I don't believe that Christians should be keeping the feasts. I know there are many different, many different ideas, many different approaches. And I, I thought I have about 40 minutes and how should I go about it? Well, I decided to approach it maybe not in a little unorthodox way, maybe a little differently than most people might expect, because what I want to do tonight is to take a, an overview, a broad overview, which I, which I hope will be able to help us to understand from a different perspective where, fee, where feast-keeping lies. You know, you've heard of the saying that, I'm sure you've heard the saying that sometimes you can't see the forest because you're looking at the trees. And, and what is implied in that statement is that sometimes... We become so wrapped up in technical details that we fail to see the broader picture. We fail to get an image of the entire thing. And because of that, sometimes we get caught up in little arguments that really are not helpful. And so tonight, what I want to do is to look at perhaps two or three broader principles. I hope that I don't get into too much technicality because I want to, I want to express this the way that I feel about it. And I feel very strongly about it. Over the past 10 years, I have been, I have been, I've been a Christian for 40 years. But over the past 10 years, my mind has been open to understand the gospel in a way I never understood before. And I've been studying righteousness by faith and the gospel for a long time, but the past 10 years. And one thing led to another until, in my understanding, the whole concept of salvation and righteousness has become very clear. And that's why I want tonight to take an overview, to, to, to get up above the, the smoke and to try to look at things in a different way. Now, the first thing I want to point out is that the Bible teaches that there has been a major change in the way God interacts with people between the Old and the New Testament. There has been a, a great change. In fact, I think Few Christians understand the magnitude of this change. The Old Testament is very, very different from the religion of the New Testament. In fact, I have said this confidently. Somebody uh, was talking to me one time about the, all the killing in the Old Testament and the Old Testament God and how, how he, he seems to be a vindictive, murderous person. And my response was simply, my religion is not based on the Old Testament. I believe in Jesus Christ and his religion. And I mean, there, there are answers to what happened in the Old Testament. I'm not dissing that or just putting it aside. But the point I'm making is that there is a vast difference in the way God interacts with the human race after Calvary and before Calvary. In fact, Jesus expressed it. Perhaps this is not the verse we might, we might want to start with, but I want to start there. In, in, in John chapter 4, Jesus met a woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. And when the woman discovered that this man was somebody unusual, she had a question that had been burning inside of her. And she put the question to Jesus. And her question was, Sir, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you Jews say that Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. And her unstated question was, Where is the true place of worship? Jesus' answer was, God is is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And he goes further to say, the father is seeking such to worship him. He says, the hour is coming and has now arrived when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the father. And I ask myself, what is he really saying? People still worship in Jerusalem. People still worship in that mountain wherever, wherever it was. What was he trying to say? And I understand his meaning to be this. The true nature of God is such that you can't limit him to places. I think that's what he's saying. The woman was asking about the true, if you want to put it in our terminology, I think she was saying, where's the true church? Now, now this is a reflection of the Old Testament concept, because in the Old Testament, you had holy places. Where the ark went, there went the presence of Jehovah. 
You can see it reflected in, in Jacob coming to the stone that evening. And he had a vision that night of a, of a ladder reaching up to heaven. And he got up in the morning and he said, what a, what, a, what a wondrous place is this. Truly, the presence of the Lord is here and I did not know. And he really believed that God was specially located at that spot. Because about 20 years later, he's going back to, to his home and, and he's coming to this place, Padan Aram. And he says to his wife, take out your earrings. Because I'm going back to Bethel where I met God. So they take out their earrings because they're coming to the sacred place where God lives. And that is the Old Testament concept. And Jesus is saying, look, God is spirit. What does he mean? He means God is of such a nature. God is such a being that you cannot limit him to places. And so those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. And God is looking for those kinds of people to worship him. What he's saying is that... As long as you have these limited concepts of God and approach him in this way, you cannot understand or see God the way he really is. And God is, I ask myself, why would God want a change in this approach? God is looking for those kinds of people. Because God wants us to become the maximum of what our potential can be. You never can rise to your full potential when you have limited concepts of God. That's what Jesus is saying. So God is looking for people who understand the kind of being he is and does not limit him to rituals, places, ceremonies, but who understands God is spirit and who worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, I'm going to suggest to you and I'm going to demonstrate it that the, the age before Jesus was primarily an age of rituals, ceremonies, representations of reality, but not reality. In fact, G John put it this way. In John 1 and verse 17, the Apostle John says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That's a verse I had a hard time understanding. Why does John say that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ? Was not the law the truth? The law told the truth in a limited way, but it was not the truth. It was not the truth because when you talk about the truth in, in, in a religious context, you are talking about the essential element that binds you to God, the essential element of worship. The representation and the illustration of truth is not truth itself. If you look at my photograph, is that the truth? It's an il illustration of me, but you have not found the truth till you have come to me personally. And Jesus was saying, I am the truth. The whole purpose of the law, the goal of the law, was to bring us to Christ. That's what the Bible says. Everything else is illustration. It's, it's a road, it's a pathway. It's something that takes us by the hand and leads us to that end point. But what we want is the end point. And when the road has taken us there, it has fulfilled its purpose. That is what John means when he says that the law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So, what we come to understand is that God's true system of government is not the principles that existed in the Old Testament. God's true system of government is really described in, 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 in Galatians 5 and verse 18 where it says, If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. That's what it means to worship God in spirit. If you are led by the Spirit... You are not under the law. It's the same thing that it says in Romans 8 and verse 14. It says, um, they, that are, they that are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And perhaps you read these verses and you think, what is really being said here? But notice, notice the concept. You are being led by the Spirit, as opposed to what? There are two different ways that you can take people and lead them or direct them. One is the way of the outside. The ceremonies, the types, the illustrations, the rituals, the commands. And you can take people in this way and try to bring them to become what God wants them to be. There is another better way. It is to be led by the Spirit. It is to be in a relationship with God that is so intimate, so close, so connected. That two minds become one mind. That two beings become one person. This is a far greater kind of relationship and when jesus says those who worship god must worship in spirit and in truth i think he's intimating all of that so 
You ask, let me give you a few examples of what I'm talking about. I, I, I mentioned this to somebody just yesterday, and the person told me that I was teaching spiritualism. Because the person said, you're talking about spiritual worship. You can't have spiritual worship without physical times, places, implements, practices. He says to just talk about being a spiritual person. Because I said, Israel today is a spiritual people, not a physical people. And he, he, he took me on. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching spiritualism. And I thought I would just give some examples of where the Bible talks about spirit versus another kind of being or another kind of worship. So we can, we can get a grasp of what I'm trying to say. Paul says that now we are delivered from the law that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Romans 7 and verse 6. Consider what that means. What does he mean by we are delivered from the law? What does he mean by we now worship in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter? What is the oldness of the letter? What is the newness of the spirit? In Romans uh, 2 verses 28 and 29 he says, The person is a Jew, is not a Jew who is one in the flesh, who is outwardly. But the true Jew is the one who is the Jew in the spirit, whose circumcision is of the heart, whose praise is not of men, but of God. In Philippians 3 and verse 3, Paul says, We are the circumcision who have no confidence in the flesh, but worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. What I'm asking you to do as, as I quote these verses is to ask yourself the question, what does he mean when he talks about the spirit in these verses? We worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh, not in the circumcision. He's talking about an outward form versus an internal experience, isn't he? It seems very clear to me this is what he's saying. To worship in the spirit means an internal experience that is based solely on your mental concepts and your faith. Whereas to worship according to the flesh is to be concerned about externals. Something external to you, some form, some ritual, some ceremony like circumcision. Or like the Jews. You're a Jew because what? You have Abraham's blood in your veins. That is outward. That is of the flesh. That is carnality. Paul says we are the true ones who are Jews in the spirit. And Jesus supported this, of course. I mean, Paul got these ideas from Jesus, right? Because, because Jesus says in, in, in Matthew 15, verses 11 to 20, he says that it is not what goes into a man that defiles the man. I know that we're not talking here about what is healthy. Jesus was not doing that. Jesus was talking about what can spiritually defile a person. And he's saying, look, you put food in your body, it passes through and it comes out. How does that defile you spiritually? He's talking about worship. He's talking about your relationship to God. And he's saying that, look, this does not defile a person. What defiles a person is what comes out of the mind. For from within out of the hearts of men proceed fornications, adulteries, murder, murders. These are the things that defile a person. Again, you see the contrast between the spiritual concept and the emphasis on the physical. Now, as I said at the beginning, I'm not denying that there was a time when God led his people by this route. It's very clear in the Bible. But I'm pinpointing Jesus' statement that the hour is coming and has now arrived. The hour is coming and has now arrived when you shall no longer worship God in that way. And this is in absolute harmony with the whole tenor of the New Testament. That there was a time when people worshipped God in this way and it was God's design, God's plan. The problem is that we need to understand how and when to make the transition from that old system to the, the new system and what exactly is the difference between both systems. Look at what Paul says in Colossians 2 verses 20 to 22. And you know, I'm kind of quoting these verses. We, we can take our time and look at them more closely, but, uh, but my time is a little limited. In, Paul, in Colossians 2, Paul says... If you have been risen with Christ, why? As though living in the world, are you still subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. 
Why are you still subject to these things? Because what he's saying is that you are not physical anymore. You have been risen with Christ. Why are you still bound by earthly limitations? That is what Paul is saying. You might not agree with Paul, but read the passage and you, you, you can't successfully counter the fact that this is what he's saying. Paul is viewing us as a spiritual people who worship in a spiritual way and who are not bound by the earthly limitations of the former religion. If you notice... Judaism still worships in that way. Islam still worships in that way. But Christianity ought to be free because we have found our Messiah. Judaism is still looking for him. Islam has none. Islam doesn't even believe that such a thing as sin exists. I heard one, one say on Religious Heart Talk, Ian's program, where he says, look here, and I want you to understand, Muslims believe we are born in a pure way. They don't believe we are born in a state of sin. I heard a Muslim say that. And man, I, I, I flinched. Because I realized that all it is is a system where you, you have your goodness inside of you and you labor to produce it. I wish them luck. It will never happen. Because God knew that we didn't need effort. We needed a savior. Hallelujah. We needed a savior. And he gave us a savior. But have we appreciated what this Savior means to us and what, what, what he has done, accomplished already? That is a question. Continuing on, 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 on some of these examples. In Galatians 4, verses 23 to 26, Paul said, This Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and represents Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem above is free which is the mother of us all. Notice again, he's always taking us into the spiritual realm and he's contrasting it with the physical limitations of the form of worship. And he says, look, the Jews are still bound to earthly Jerusalem. The Jews are still on the Mount Sinai. They are still bound to externals and outward things. We have risen above that. Our mother is Jerusalem above and she is free. And he says of, he says of Mount Sinai, he says, what does the scripture say? cast out the bond woman and her son. Paul is very uncompromising and very clear, I believe, in some of the things he says. One of the, re the, the, real, the real problems, one of the most confusing things is that people take Paul and they twist and turn him every way and they make him very difficult to understand. You know, somebody says, well, well Peter said, Paul, is, Paul has written some things hard to be understood. Rubbish. Even if Peter said so. You know why? Peter was a Jew. God didn't choose somebody to carry the gospel who was hard to be understood. The Jews had a problem with Paul, not the Gentiles. They had, it was blessedly easy for them to understand Paul. But you know what? The Jews were locked into the legal thinking, the mindset of the law. And so Paul's statements, they can't fathom what this guy is doing. One time Peter comes down to, to, to Antioch and he's eating with the Gentiles. Then these men come from James. Look here, James... You mean the head cook and bottle wash up at Jerusalem? And Peter jumps up and he stands one side. He withdraws from his fellowship with the Gentiles because he's afraid of James. Huh. That's pretty amazing. But that is what is happening in the Bible. And Paul says to him, Paul rebukes him to his face. These are the people who wanted to bring in circumcision upon the Gentiles. It was okay if they did it. It was their culture. It was their lifestyle. Now they're imposing it on the Gentiles. The Apostle Paul was hard to be understood for these people because for them, he was destroying their religion and their culture. He was indeed. But he was gracious enough to say, look, I'm leaving you Jews alone, but don't come and mess with my Gentile converts. So Paul, Paul is a person who is most clear. If you go to the Bible, you'll find where James says, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. He's addressing Jews. And he says... He contradicts Paul because Paul says, you see, brethren, how that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And James says, you see, brethren, how a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. So there, 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 there is a, a tension there. And I'm just saying this, maybe I'm wasting my time to go into that because I, my time is limited. But what I'm saying is, the Apostle Paul's statements are clear and unambiguous. Some people have approached them by trying to, to split 
most of them and saying, look, here he's talking about ceremonial laws and here he's talking about the moral law. I agree that there are rare occasions where he's focusing on the moral law. But by and large, when Paul talks about the law, he means the system of government. If you ask, what was the law? It was a system of government by which God interacted with Israel, with the Hebrews. That system of interaction, I want to put it that way. And, and that system of interaction was the way God governed them, the way God taught them, the way God controlled them and disciplined them. It was a system of government specifically tailored to a group of people. And you know, it's interesting because in 1 Timothy 1, verses 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul tells us, For we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Because there is an unlawful way to use the law. But what is the lawful way? Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person. What? Then it means that if you have become a righteous person for you, the law basically becomes irrelevant as far as governing you are concerned. The law is not made for a righteous person. You come in here tonight and you see a sign at the door. Please don't spit on the floor. What comes to your mind? There are some very strange people coming into this room. Because that sign is not put there for me. Because I never had that inclination to spit on the floor. If they see it necessary to put a sign, don't spit on the floor. You can gather from this that there are some people who have the tendency to spit on the floor. So the system of the law was designed for a carnal people. All aspects of it. There was the moral part of it, the Ten Commandments. And people say the Ten Commandments was a transcript of God's character. That is, that is outrageous. It was an expression of God's character. Don't use the word transcript. You can't write that character across the heavens if you have a thousand, a million years. You can't do it. You can't put it in ten sentences. It was lim a limited expression of morality. It was true, but it was limited. And of course, God put that on stone so the people could know it was dealing with morality. But then you had, you had the, the civil laws to govern carnal people. When you, talk, when, you, when you see God telling them to stone people who were caught picking up sticks on the Sabbath day, you say, how harsh and terrible. That's a, an indication to us of the kinds of people he was dealing with. You see, you, you see in Jamaica, they are, they are saying, bring back the death sentence. You see in Saudi Arabia or some of these places, you steal something, they cut off your hand. You think they have the crime problem that we have here? It doesn't change people. But it brings carnality under some kind of control. The more carnal the hearts, the harsher the penalties. That's what was happening under the system of the law. Harsh penalties because the people were brutal and carnal. You don't believe me? Go read the book of Judges and see the things that they did. It appalls you. You wonder how any people could ever behave in this depraved way. The Israelites. But that was the kind of people God was dealing with. So he had to deal with them. He had to set up a, a government that was harsh. And that was uncompromising. They also had health principles. Because God did his best to preserve them. Because you see... This Hebrew nation was going to be the incubator that would produce the Messiah. If you, ever, if you ever want to understand the purpose of the Hebrew nation in a nutshell, I'm going to tell you what it was. They were simply created by God as an institution to produce the Messiah. That was what Israel was, was raised up for. And when the Messiah came, Israel had fulfilled its purpose. Now we move from the old typical Israel the, 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 the national Israel, and we move to the true Israel of whom our king and our head and our life is Jesus Christ. And if we are adopted into Christ, then we are the true Israel. Because there's a new nation of Israel, but the identifying mark is the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what old Israel was supposed to do, to prepare to be an incubator in which this New, this, this, this Messiah could appear. And they fulfilled the purpose. Unwittingly, they fulfilled the purpose. And when Christ came, their day and their system came to an end. So, and, and, and also, one other thing that was in the law was that there were illustrations of salvation. We call them types of and shadows. There, was, there were moral laws, there were helpful principles, there were civil laws, and there were types and shadows or illustrations of salvation. 
You can find them everywhere in the law. They never saved anybody. They never helped anybody to be saved. But they taught them of the salvation that was to come. Like the lamb, for example. The lamb that you killed was an illustration of the coming Messiah who was to die for our, our sins. Everywhere in the law you find these illustrations. And so, I want to ask a question. Because I have to tie it together. Where do the feast days fall in all of this? For me, this is a macro view that makes me easily place the feast days. In the Garden of Eden, there was a perfect system. And there God ordained the perfect system of government and lifestyle that he wanted for mankind for eternity. There are only two institutions that come out of the Garden of Eden. One of them is a Sabbath, and one of them is marriage. Feast days belong to a system that was instituted at the Exodus. When God gave the Israelites the first command to observe the Passover, he says, this shall be the beginning of months to you. At somewhere in Exodus 12, he says, this shall be the beginning of months. It was the beginning of their religious system, the beginning of their religious year. And he instituted the feast days. But what do these feast days represent? I mean, all of you understand this. I can't tell you anything about what they represent, which is wonderful, but a little bit amazing. Because you know that the Passover represented the death of Christ. You know that the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread represented the end of sin. The escape from sin. Which Jesus did for us. You know that they, the first fruits represented his resurrection and his ascension to heaven as the first fruits of the new creation. You know that 50 days later when Pentecost came, it was the glorification of Christ and the pouring out of his life upon his people once and for all and forever. And you know what the others mean, right? The blowing of trumpets, the day of atonement which, 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 which are to take place in these latter times. So you understand that everything that was in those feast days was an illustration of the ministry of Jesus Christ. None of them represented what the people were to do. They all represented what Jesus Christ would do for humanity. Example, at the Passover, what did humanity do? Nothing. Christ died. Christ paid the price. Christ's blood was shed. What did man do? Nothing except to help to kill him. Man was not involved. It was the work of Christ. At Pentecost, what did the people do? Nothing. They were just waiting. And the Holy Spirit came upon them. Christ did something. Something happened in heaven. And the effects were felt on earth. When the wave chief was offered, what did they do? They didn't even know that Christ was risen from the dead. He was raised from the dead, went back to heaven as the first fruits of the harvest of the earth. Everything in those feast days is the work of Jesus Christ. Therefore, Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Christ is the goal of the law. Christ is the purpose of the law, as we are told in Romans 10 and verse 4, and many other places, Galatians 3 and verse 24. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, after that, to, to, to Christ. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Galatians 3 and verse 19. Wherefore then serve at the law? What is the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come. There's an end point to the system of the law. And that end point was the coming of the seed. Since that time, God's people worship not in places, ceremonies, according to circumstances, or even days, months, times, and years. We worship in spirit and in truth, which means we worship a God who is universally present every place, every time, every circumstance. Our heart is one with his Praise the Lord in Jesus Christ forever in every circumstance. We don't need times and places and ceremonies to interact with our God anymore. He has instituted a new system that is far more effective than the former system. We don't need that system anymore unless we have not found Jesus Christ. That is a million dollar point, brothers and sisters. You know, Paul talking about the obsession of the Galatians with the law. He said, let me tell you, if you are circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. What? A man is circumcised and he loses Christ? How is that possible? I mean, you just go to a little ceremony and, and you lose Christ. Why? What about all those people who are 
circumcised for medical reasons. That's not what he's talking about at all. You know that Paul circumcised Timothy, right? So Paul went against his own counsel when he circumcised Timothy. But what Paul is talking about is the reason for your behavior because motive is everything. We, we walk by faith. So if your faith is right, you are blessed. If your faith is wrong, instead of a blessing, you might receive a curse. So Paul is talking about the kind of faith that makes you think you need to interact with the law in order to be acceptable to God. That's what Paul is talking about. He's talking about circumcision for a religious reason. And he says, if this happens, Christ has become of none effect unto you. Now I ask you the question. How can we successfully accept what Paul says about circumcision? How can we successfully accept the biblical mandate that sacrifices are done away with forever and still cling to certain aspects of the law? To my mind, this is inconsistent. It is saying that God, we, we split up the law into bits and pieces and we keep some and we throw away some. How consistent is that? The law is a system. It was not a bits and pieces thing. It was a system of government. It stands together or it falls together. And I know I have to touch on an important point because undoubtedly the question comes, are you saying that the Ten Commandments are also obsolete? And I need to be careful how I answer because, yes, I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't be out of place if I said yes. And yet I would, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would tell you that I walk in harmony with the Ten Commandments. But not because of the Ten Commandments. As far as my experience is concerned, you know what the Bible says? We serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. In 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 6, Paul says that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And he explains what he means. He talks about the ministry of death written and then graven in stones. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. If you never read it yet, read it. Because that's one passage that I never ever heard preached about in my days as a Sabbath keeper. Nobody touched it. But it says that the ministry of death written and then graven in stones was glorious. But the ministry of the Spirit is far more glorious. And he says we worship in, not in the letter. For the letter kills. The letter is what is written. The letter is what is prescribed. The spirit is the essence of, the, of what the law was looking for, inscribed into our natures by the spirit of the living God. When God gives you his spirit, he gives you the new covenant. He places the spirit of his son in your heart. And that spirit of his son transforms you from the inside, independent of words or rules or regulations. You become like Jesus Christ and you operate on the same basis as God operates. Why does God do good? Does he get up in the morning to consult Ten Commandments? No. God is good because his nature is good. His nature produces good. And when we are born of God, we are the sons of the living God, we operate on the same basis. You see, the law leaves me stranded because the law demands, and as long as I'm operating on the basis of the law, what I'm saying is, the law is asking something of a carnal person. As long as I'm operating on the basis of the law. Paul says, when I would do good, what happened? Evil presents itself. Paul says, with my mind, I delight in the law of God. Is that not, not where we are? This is the condition of, man, of a man who is under the law, being led by the law, directed by the law. He wants to do good, and he cannot. It doesn't work. We need a different system, and that system is, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ. What the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin and condemned sin in the flesh. That the, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. In us. Because we're not following the law. If you follow the law, you will always fulfill the lust of the flesh. And that's exactly what Romans 7 is talking about. The, the truth is that I need five hours. <laughs> the truth is. Because this, this subject is so comprehensive, but so wonderful when you understand it. Listen, I was born a Seventh-day Adventist. I grew up a Seventh-day Adventist, so I am not antinomian. And I am not, I'm not taking an Adventist approach either. Because the Adventist answers are inadequate. I agree with that 100%. Some people say today I was accused of saying the same things as the Pentecostals. 
And I will, I will call a few other names. Well, I think they have some truth too. Their understanding has taken them a little too far. And our understanding has taken us a little too near. There's a balance somewhere. And perhaps we can learn something about them. One of the thing, from them. One of the things I understand is that we talk too little about the kingdom. We understand too little of what God did in Jesus Christ. I praise and thank God. The, the last 10 years, Jesus is singing in my heart. And I'm not trying. Before that, I had to try. When I preached, I had to find a place to put in Jesus. Because my heart didn't sing. Because I didn't understand what God did for us through his son. But Jesus Christ is God's answer. Comprehensively. And it is the antitype. He is the antitype to the system of the law. And I think, I think my time is just about up. So, I'm going to stop here. I want to say again, I appreciate you having me. I appreciate you listening. And I guess whatever happens, I appreciate your comments, your questions, your thoughts. God bless you. <laughs>